You know, the um, wisdom of man is, is folly. I would like to read to you a few statements made by great men. In 1949, this statement was made in Popular Mechanics. Computers in the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons. <laughs> Thomas Watson, the great chairman of IBM in 1943, made this remark. I believe there is a world market for maybe five computers. The editor in charge of business books for Prentice Hall in 1957 went on record with this statement. I have traveled the length and breadth of this country and talked with the best people and I can assure you that data processing is a fad that won't last out the year. <laughs> At the Advanced Computing Systems Division of IBM in 1968, an engineer prognosticated on the microchip by saying, what is it good for? Ken Olson, the president and chairman and founder of Digital Equipment Corporation in 1977 said, there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Back in 1876, Western Union, in an internal memo, this was sent. This, quote, telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. The wireless music box has no imaginable commercial value. Who would pay for a message sent to nobody in particular. This is David Sarnoff's associates in response to his urgings for investment in radio in 1920. This is the last one. This is, kind of, what, this is one of the last ones. This is kind of neat. Quote, the concept is interesting and well formed, but in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. A Yale University management professor wrote these remarks in response to Fred Smith's paper proposing reliable overnight delivery service. Smith, as you may know, is the founder of FedEx. <laughs> the concept is interesting and well formed, but in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. And last, Warner Brothers, H.M. Warner of Warner Brothers in 1927 said, who in the world wants to hear actors talk? <laughs> I want to share those little snippets with you because the wisdom of man is so, is so foolish. And, and God delights in the foolishness of the gospel in revealing concepts and truths that the simple of heart and the simple of mind can understand. The brilliant brains that we have at work today, you know, you were here in the Austin area and here in this area, IBM has a large facility, and Dell Computer has a large facility, and there are others, Motorola, and they have a presence here, and Samsung, and so forth and so on. But I want you to understand that all of this wealth and all of this marvelous engineering and all of these great systems are not as a result of the prowess of men. They are the gift of God. And, you, and I made that statement one time in a seminar, and somebody challenged me and said, how would you prove that? I said, it's simple. Why didn't they do it 200 years ago? Man has had, you know, 5,800 years to give this a try. Why, did, why now? Why did, it, why did man finally get here now? 
If this was man's prowess, man could have done this 2,000 years ago. Yes or no? But it was God. All the things you see in this room, including these computers up, up here and the television, all of these things come out of the earth. There is no new material here that just suddenly appeared. Everything that you see in this room has come up out of the earth. It's been here for thousands of years. But it was God who gave man the understanding. And those who have used and diligently used that gift have prospered. But there's a question that we have to always ask ourselves. In our prosperity, is it possible that we can forget the source of our prospering? God told Israel, he says, I know that when you enter the promised land and you become wealthy and you become rich and you become increased with goods and you become overweight, that's what he said, you'll forget me. You'll forget me. I want to explain to you something about an ancient custom that is important to understand. It was considered to be the part of the Geneva Convention. You know what I mean by that? The Geneva Convention is a document that all the nations of the world, presumably, quotes, have agreed on that when warfare is conducted, these are the rules of engagement. These are the rules of war. So the Geneva Convention is an attempt to have everybody not kill the civilians and bomb the hospitals. Of course, it means nothing if nobody's looking, you know, in war. But the Geneva Convention was a... In ancient times, if a tribal nation... Now, here again is the Mediterranean Sea. And, um, as, and this, is the, this is the land of Israel. As, as King David was uh, taking, here's Jerusalem. As King David was setting up and purging the territory so that he could rule over this territory, there was a pocket of Moabites down here who refused to pay tax, tribute. And this little... Uh, nation, tribal nation of the Moabites, um, were very um, uh, antagonistic toward David's insistence that they pay the king a ransom, a healthy ransom. And uh, so when they rebelled, it was understood in ancient times that it was the king, it was the victor's prerogative to utterly destroy those in rebellion. You know, the way the IRS works today. <laughs> Notice what happened in 2 Samuel 8, verse 2. David also defeated the Moabites. He made them lie down on the ground, and he measured them off with a length of cord. So after he defeated them, he had them all line up and stand in, in order like this. And he just stretched them out as far as they would go in single file. Then the Bible says, every two links of them were put to death. And the third length was allowed to live. He took a rope and he measured off two links. And everybody in the two links is put to death. The way this was done in ancient times, they had them lay down on the ground side by side. They just made them lay right down on the grass. And if you were in the two links of rope, the spear, the soldiers would just spear the survivors and kill them right there. And uh, one third is allowed to live. Notice this next sentence. This is kind of interesting. So, the Moabites became subject to David and paid tax. Gladly. <coughs> David 
knew that in sparing one third, that out of gratitude, out of gratitude, the Moabites would pay, ta would pay tax. And he had a tax base left. Smart guy. They're happy to be alive. He's happy to get the tax. What's the problem here? But it was well within his prerogative to destroy the whole thing. It was understood that a king could not tolerate treason or rebellion in his kingdom. This concept is seen in Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 12. Notice where the God says to Ezekiel. We just read this text. A third of your people will die of the plague or perish by famine inside you, and a third will fall by the sword outside your walls. And a third I will scatter to the winds and pursue with drawn sword. So when God has Nebuchadnezzar come down to destroy Jerusalem, how many does God kill? Two-thirds. And spares? One-third. God spares one-third, kills two-thirds. That's the Geneva Convention of ancient times. This is the way, a, this is the right of a king who is conquering and destroying a rebellious nation. Now, when we get to the seven trumpets, we're going to look at the world for a moment, and a very beautiful thing happens. I like this. God is so neat. This is the world. And the world's actually a little ob uh, oblong, so I'm just trying to be faithful in my rendering. <laughs> the first angel sounded his trumpet. There came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up. A third. That would mean how much is spared. Good. A third of the trees were burned up. So how much, how, how, how are the trees spared? How much of the, how many trees are spared? Two-thirds. Twelve times. I'm not going to go through them now, but twelve times we have one-third, 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 one-third. And really what the Bible is saying, that a God of mercy is, has the right, according to the Geneva Convention, to destroy the whole thing. But out of mercy, he destroys a third and, and, and spares two thirds. If David was generous in sparing one third, what is God in sparing two? Yes. Make sense? That's why the seven trumpets are a time period. I, I, I know that's too faint to see. The, the seven trumpets is a time of mercy. Even in God's wrath, even in the exercise of His wrath, His mercy is extended to save to the utmost. And the day the earthquake happens, the day the censers cast down in heaven's court, and we're going to be talking about the, the sanctuary and the use of the censer and the altar of incense and how this means the end of the daily in heaven's process. A lot of interesting things we've got to cover here. But when God, when the, when the angel cast down the censer and the rumblings and the peals of thunder and the lightnings and the earthquake and the hailstorm begins, these first four trumpets occur over a period, as I understand it, about 30 to 60 days. And during this time period, God's interest is not in saving the planet. God's interest is in saving those people who are sincere of heart and who want to know what is the will of God. Interesting, let me talk about this for just a minute. When God's judgments occur, it produces very different reactions. Let me show you uh, in a brief scenario, as best I can, how this works out. Here's a timeline. And this timeline is going to be the seven trumpets and this is 1260 days. We begin with an earthquake. And wherever you are, when this earthquake happens, that's where you're going to stay. 
God is going to drop all the overpasses and all the bridges. God is going to pull apart all the runways. God is going to fracture the earth in such a way that wherever you are is where you're going to stay. Communications are going to be broken. Banking and manufacturing and everything will come to an end. Transportation is over. The infrastructure that we call freeways here in the United States, the communication we enjoy by satellites, the whole thing comes apart in this 30 days to 60 day time period. Wherever you are is where you're going to stay. God does this for an important reason. Here's the earth. And so what he does is that he breaks the world up into little pieces. And guess what he has in each quadrant? He has his servants, the prophets. If you divide 144,000 into 6 billion, you come out with a ratio of about one servant per population of 50,000, approximately. That means the United States would have about 7,000 of the 144,000. That means that China would have about 29,000 of the 144,000. That means that uh, India would have about 28,000 of the 144,000. God breaks up the earth, tears it apart, so that wherever you are is where you stay. There's no way to get to another point. Travel, the whole infrastructure is shut. What good will a Lexus be if you can't get a gallon of gasoline? Or for that matter, a moped. Zero. Bicycle? There you go, Dave. How far do you want to pedal that thing? <laughs> when you, when most... See, the reason that most people do not understand Revelation's story is that they don't understand the setting that the trumpets put it within. That is the fatal flaw. They don't understand the earthquake. They don't understand these physical phenomena, the asteroid impacts. They don't understand the volcanic eruptions. They don't understand the great fires that burn up everything. And this, in, this is the the main ingredient for getting the story going. You know, here's an interesting point. In the Old Testament, the Feast of Trumpets began on the first day of the seventh month every year. The Feast of Trumpets, and according to Jewish literature, this is kind of an interesting thing, Here's a, here's a trumpet, here's a trumpet blower. And this, on the, on, the, on the Feast of Trumpets, began on the first day of the seventh month. Jewish literature says that they would have a group of priests standing on a prominent place, on a hill, and they would blow their horns until they are so winded they could hardly stand up. And when they have just blown as long as they could, another group of priests would come forward and blow their horn so that the noise would continue. And when these guys had just about blown their, till their cheeks are just killing them, you know. You ever try to blow up a balloon when you were a child that was just a little too tough for you? Remember how it hurts your jaw? Another group of priests would come forward and they would blow their horns. And so for nine days a constant noise was heard. These guys out there on the hilltop blowing the horn. And what are they blowing their horns about? What is the big deal? The Day of Atonement, which is the tenth day of the seventh month. The purpose of the trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets and the sounding of the trumpets that would follow, is very elegantly simple. 
Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. And you know, every Israelite knew when probation would close. It occurred at sundown as the tenth day was beginning. In the first uh, segment that we had this past Sabbath, I presented how that the, the uh, tribes came to the sanctuary according to their cycle in the months. Remember? So that your family, if you're in the tribe of Benjamin, your month to take your sacrifices to the temple and so forth were, were always prearranged. Twelve tribes, twelve months. And the cycle was... That way, three million people could be serviced in the desert in the wilderness. If, perchance, there were some matters that needed to be resolved that were serious enough, on these nine days, there was time for the representatives of each tribe to provide the necessary sacrifice. Jews today consider the nine days of the trumpets to be the days of judgment. Get ready to meet thy God, O Israel. And every Jew knows that the judgment ends, the day that mercy ends at the evening when the tenth day begins. The parallel here, we're back to parallels and patterns. Remember, that's what this seminar is about. The, the, the parallel here is that the seven trumpets of Revelation have a defined duration. The close of probation will not catch anyone by surprise. Not one. Those who have had a chance and ever in the world will have a chance to hear the gospel because God will have his representatives speaking in every quadrant. You know, the neat thing about this, let me, let me digress for another moment for a second. If you talk to the Jehovah's Witness, they'll tell you that the 144,000 are going to come out of their church. If you talk to the Mormon, he'll tell you the 144,000 is going to come out of his church. If you talk to the Adventist, he's going to tell you the 144,000 will come out of his church. If you talk to the Catholic, he'll tell you the 144,000 will come out of his church. You see a parallel? Everybody believes the same thing, but they appropriate it unto themselves. Religion is the most, one of the most arrogant things that you can imagine. Let me, let me pause for just a moment. Dave put the recorder on pause. I want to get an article that just... Religion is an amazing thing. I have here the Watchtower, April 1, 1993. Uh, a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses came to my door passing out literature. And um, I like to take it and see what it says. So I accepted it, and um, Why Be Baptized is the name of the article, on the lead article. But as I began to read, I turned to page 16, and I want to read this sentence to you and see if you can identify with it. It can be confidently said that the New World Society of Jehovah's Witnesses is the true light-bearing organization today representing the message of Jesus Christ. Now, every religion would say that of itself. What religion can you think of that says we believe that X religion over here has more light than we do. It doesn't happen. For this reason, religious people can't talk to each other. They can only talk past each other. Right? How can the Jew tell the Muslim about God? How can the Muslim tell you about God? It's 
not possible, is it? God understands that. And this is why, this is what, this is what's so neat about the 144,000. 144,000 will come out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and they will be from every religious body. They will come out of every religious body. Let me explain how this works, because it's so simple that even a rocket scientist could understand it. In Ezekiel chapter 2, the Lord came to Ezekiel and he said, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. And as he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Ezekiel at this time is only about 17 years of age, just a young fellow. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. So Ezekiel and Ezekiel is one of the most timid persons. He's even more timid than Joey. <laughs> Ezekiel is a very timid guy, and God is saying, Ezekiel, I have chosen you, and I'm going to send you to this rebellious nation. The people to whom I am sending you are real nice <laughs> and easy to get along with. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, da, 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 da. God says, they are obstinate and they are stubborn, but I want you to go ahead and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or whether they fail to listen, for they are, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. So far okay? Everybody with me? And you, son of man, you do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid. Though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions, do not be afraid of what they say or be terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. You must speak. What do these two words say right here? My words. God chose a timid man because of Noisy man would probably use his own words. God chose a man a few words. You must speak my words to them, and whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, you listen to what I say to you, and do not rebel like that rebellious house. So open your mouth, and you eat what I'm about to give you. The point, you know the rest of the story. He eats the book, and it's sweet as honey in his mouth, and it's bitter in his stomach. And um, this scroll had writing on both sides, words of lament and mourning and woe. And he said, Son of man, eat the scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat the scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. And I ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. And he said to me, Son of man, go now to the house of Israel and do what? Speak my words. Here's my point. Ezekiel knew nothing. Ezekiel did not have the word of the Lord in him until it was given to him. You get, get that? Let me say that again. Ezekiel is just an ordinary guy. Going about his duties, doing whatever he was to do in his Babylonian captivity. And one day God came to him and, and, and the Lord said, Ezekiel, I'm going to put my words in you and you speak my words. I don't want you preaching. I don't want you making up what you want to say. I want you to speak my words. And I'm going to give you my words, and they're in this little book, and you're going to eat this, and then you're going to repeat what the words are. 
and in your mouth, the understanding of what these words include is so sweet. But delivering it to this group of people it will be awful, bitter. What I'm trying to lead you to see is that the 144,000 are just like Ezekiel. God's going to take a Muslim in a Muslim area and he's going to find a sincere person just like Ezekiel was a Jew and he's going to give his word to that sincere person and that person like Ezekiel will faithfully discharge his duty. He will be what I called an enlightened Muslim. And God will have, get this, God will have an enlightened Muslim speaking to his brothers in a context that they all understand. God's going to do the same thing with a Jew. He's going to do the same thing with a Hindu. He'll even do the same thing with a Catholic and a Protestant. What God is going to do, get this, now let me, make, let me be really clear on this. If a Muslim came to you, dear Christians, what would be the likelihood he's going to convince you that he has truth and you don't? Zero. Flip this coin around, zero. it's still zero. God is very smart. He knows the problem. So what's he going to do? He reaches each audience with his own kind. You know, this, is, this parallel is found in Revelation chapter 10 where John is given the book from the angel's hand, remember? He's told to eat it and he's told then to go and prophesy again down here in the last verse of uh, chapter 10. This is a parallel. This is a parallel. John is, is, is living out the experience of the 144,000. 144,000 Johns, if you will. John is, and the first thing he does is that he's going to go and measure the temple of God. He's going to count the Protestants and the Christians first. The first people to be measured and sorted and sifted will be Christians. And then the others will follow. But God will raise up people. And so this is the bottom line, basically. You're going to have brothers speaking to brothers. Let me show you, let me show you this. Joel 2, 28. Scripture says, and afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. What is that? Well, how many does that include? Everybody everywhere. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. That makes them prophets. Men and women. Men and women. And Shirley asked me about this one day. She said, what do you think, why do you think God is going to give the old men dreams and the young men will see visions? Why do you think he does it? I said, well, here's what I think will happen. When God selects this representative to speak for him in this quadrant, God will confirm that what this man is saying in the hearts of others who are also sincere through dreams and visions. What happened to Pilate's wife when Jesus was brought before Pilate? She had a dream. And what did God tell her in this dream? He revealed who he really was. That's right. And what I'm saying is that God will use dreams and visions to confirm that what this brother is saying to his brothers is the truth. And the physical phenomenon, the earth totally devastated, will have everyone's attention. See, God is in, he, he knows, if he puts on a really big show here, people will listen. Right now they can't. Paradigms prevent it. Religion prevents it. Experience prevents it. And instead of this seminar only covering a few people, 
The, this, the, the, the significance of this topic should fill an entire stadium. What's the likelihood of that happening? Zero. You say HBO Showtime and Movie House get more traction than we do. Uh, um, unfortunately, yes. So the message that the world needs to hear can't be heard because every religion has their own thing. And so you can't tell religious people what the Bible says. The rapturist, don't bother me with this. I'm out of here. The historicist, don't bother me. That's been fulfilled. The end result's the same. God is going to pour out His Spirit on all people. And that means everybody in every quadrant. And the Spirit is going to stir deeply in every heart. Notice this next verse. Even on my what? Servants. Watch this. I'm going to jump to Revelation 7, 3. Do not harm the land or the sea of the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of what? The servants. The servants. It's actually the servants, the prophets. Because we read in Revelation 10, verse 7, But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished. I'll explain that in a second. Just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. What is the mystery of God? Mystery of God is this. The ceiling. What God is going to do during this time period is that He is going to first He's going to see that everyone on earth hears the terms and conditions of the gospel. Number two. He's going to see that every person makes a decision for it or against it. God forces, through the circumstances, everyone to make a decision. There will be no middle ground. Number three, God is going to test the faith of every person in their decision. And then... For those who stand firm in their faith, even to death as necessary, they're going to be sealed. What is this? Here's what it is. God is going to, you know, when, when you become a born-again person, there are two of you. There are two people in every born-again person. And these two people fight all the time against each other. It's the carnal and the spiritual. And in Romans 7, Paul says, what I wouldn't want to do, I do. And what I would do, I don't do. And he said, I know it's the law of sin that's working within me. And how will I ever escape this? Well, the answer is simple. For the people who live during this time period only, this is the judgment of the living, incidentally. The judgment of the living begins right here. The people who meet the test, who hear the gospel, make the decision to stand loyal to Jesus, they're going to observe and honor him on his Sabbath. They're going to be tested in their faith. And once they pass the test of faith, God is going to remove the carnal nature. And then he will seal them like that throughout eternity. In other words, the propensity for sin will be eliminated. They will be sealed in the nature that Adam had when he was created. And this is how the saints go through the great time of the seven last plagues. And sin isn't an issue because they have no proclivity for wrongdoing. They're like Adam and Eve before the fall. This is the ceiling. This is the character and transformation 
not the character, I, I shouldn't say, I should say the nature, the transformation of the nature so that there is no more sin. And this is why Jesus says at the close of the seventh trumpet, he that's holy, let him be holy still. He that's filthy, let him be filthy still. That doesn't mean you can't sin. The power of choice always remains. It just means that the carnal nature is no longer there. The power of choice always remains. Well, God is going to send his servants, the prophets, throughout the world. And like Ezekiel, they're going to give a powerful. The world will be duly informed. And Jesus, Jesus said, when this gospel of the kingdom has been preached into all the world, then the end will come. Let me conclude. I've just got a couple of minutes. I want to, let me jump forward here for just a second. There's one thing I wanted to, pre uh, to present tonight. And um, yes. The rise and fall of powerful kings may be explained in one simple concept. God anointed, God rejected. What can be said of Hitler? Nebuchadnezzar, Napoleon, Saul, David, Roosevelt, Carter, Clinton, and Gore, or Bush. The sovereignty of God and the, and the authority of God and the work of God is much more inclusive than we typically think. The ownership of God, the reason for the coming wrath is simply that we have a world in total rebellion. That's why the wrath. And the full cup. The cup is just about ready to spill over. And this tomorrow I'm going to talk about the casting down of the censer and the end of the daily. A process that's been going on in heaven for 6,000 years. The daily began when Adam and Eve sinned. The daily represents the intercession of Christ on behalf of Adam and Eve and their offspring. And a time is coming when the daily will end. Let me leave you with this closing text. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 13, uh, 11, the Bible says from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished, and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. But blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. Basically, the idea here, the daily ends, the tribulation begins, the abomination that causes desolation is set up at 1290, but blessed is the one who waits for and reaches. Where's the 12th? Oh, I'm sorry. I drew that I drew that backwards. The question is, where is the 1260 of the trumpets? I drew that backwards. It goes this way. The abomination that causes desolation is a universal death decree for the saints. If there's no communication and no travel, how can all the world wander after the beast and set up a universal law? Because the beast can fly. The devil and his angels can travel. Have wings, will fly. We've got a lot more to cover. There's a lot more to come. We've, we've just touched the surface. And I realize I'm going around in some circles here, but I want to make sure we're all on the 
same wavelength. Well, it's been great to be here tonight. Let's stand for the benediction and we will close. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your great compassion and your goodness and your mercies to us. Thank you for your word. And as we have looked, we can see that you have a plan, you have a purpose, and because you are a God of love, you are anxious to save to the utmost. We also realize that a world like in Noah's day and in the days of Lot, Sodom, and Gomorrah, that your love doesn't have much redeeming effect on the hearts of many. This is why your wrath becomes the only way to reach people that will reconsider their ways and many will repent and be saved. Thank you for helping us to understand that even in your wrath, there is mercy. Bless each one now. Keep us safe and bring us back again tomorrow night is our prayer in your wonderful name. Amen. Well, may God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow evening at 6.59.